Hi everyone, I'm Jackie, and today I will be going over Blue Book Exam 1, the latest update from College Board as of August 2024. This is when the video was made, in particular August 29th. Okay, so let's just jump in. Okay, so first we have vocab and contacts. Researchers and conservationists stress that biodiversity loss due to invasive species is, hmm. For example, people can take simple steps such as washing their footwear after travel to avoid potentially invasive organisms into new environments. Okay, so it sounds to me what they're providing in this example is something that people can do to prevent something from happening. So it seems that it can be preventable. And I'm basing this on the context given in the example. Continuing our journey. Um, two, it is by no means hmm, to recognize the influence of Dutch painter Hieronymus Bosch and Ali Banasader's paintings. Indeed, Banasader himself cites Bosch as an inspiration. However, some scholars have suggested that the ancient Mesopotamian poem Epic of Gilgamesh may have had a far greater impact on um, ba Bani Sutter's work. Okay, so here we can see by no means right before the blank. So this is negative connotation. And if I pair it with another negative, it will make it positive. So the only other negative word in the context is C. So if I put unimportant here, it becomes negative, which equals a positive output, which actually makes it important. So another way I can read this is it is important to recognize the, influ the influence of Dutch painter Hieronymus Bosch on Ali Bamister's paintings. Indeed, himself cites him as inspiration. So he is an important influence. Okay, so always be careful. There's usually one or two of these on every exam for the negative connotation before the blank that um, can change it. So two negatives equal positive. Continuing our journey. Astronomers are confident that the star Betelgeuse will eventually consume all the helium in its core and explode in a supernova. They are much less confident, however, about when this will happen, since that depends on internal characteristics of Betelgeuse that are largely unknown. Astrophysicist Serafina al Badri, Nance, and colleagues recently investigated whether acoustic waves in the star could be used to determine internal stellar states, but concluded that this method could not sufficiently reveal Betelgeuse's internal characteristics to allow its evolutionary state to be firmly fixed. Okay, and then I'm asked, which choice best describes the function of the underlying sentence of the text? So, A, it describes a serious limitation of the method used by Nance and colleagues. Um, there is no serious limitation that was discussed, so going to discard. B, it presents the central finding reported by Nance and colleagues. There is no central finding um, reported by Nance and colleagues happening in the underlying portion. Eliminate. C, it identifies the problem that Nance and colleagues attempted to solve, but did not. I think that could work. What's the problem that Nance and colleagues attempted to solve? Um, when the, well, when it will explode, when Betelgeuse will explode into a supernova. I think this could win, but let's check D. D, it explains how the work of Nance and Collies was received by others in the field. It doesn't talk about how the work was received by others. So therefore, it must be option C. And what did they attempt to solve? They discuss here how they attempt to solve it, but in the end, it um, could not sufficiently reveal the internal characteristics, you know, to know when it will become a supernova. Moving on. Oh, the mimosa tree evolved in East Asia where the beetle Brucidius Terranus preys on its seeds. In 1785, mimosa trees were introduced to North America, far from any bee Terranus. 
but evolutionary links between predators and their prey can persist across centuries and continents. Around 2001, Beteris was introduced in southeastern North America, near where botanist Su Chang, Soon Mei Chang, and colleagues have been monitoring mimosa trees. Within a year, 93% of the trees had been attacked by beetles. Which choice best describes the function of the third sentence in the overall structure of the text? All right, so let's let's see. So A, it states the hypothesis that Chang and colleagues had set out to investigate using most of the trees and B, Trinus. Um, well, when I was reading, I didn't notice any hypothesis that was made. There is no hypothesis mentioned. Um, if anything, it's just a pretty general statement. So gonna eliminate. B, it presents a generalization that is exemplified by the discussion of the mimosa trees and B. Turinas. Um, this might be, because like this is saying that it presents a generalization and then it's exemplified further here. And I would say this sentence here does seem like it is a generalization, um, but I'm gonna keep it and check the rest. C, it provides context that clarifies why the species mentioned, uh, by the species mentioned spread to new locations. Well, it's not, there is no talk about the species spreading to new locations in the underlying portion, so no. And D, it offers an alternative explanation for the findings of Chang and colleagues. Um, it's not giving an alternative explanation. It just gives a generalization and then they provide an example of that generalization. So therefore, it must be correct choice B. Continuing. Oh, cross text. Okay. So what I'll do here is read text one. When companies in the same industry propose merging with one another, they often claim that the merger will benefit consumers by increasing efficiency and therefore lowering prices. Economist Yin Yang investigated this notion in the context of the United States newspaper market. She modeled a hypothetical merger of the Minneapolis area newspapers and found that the subscription prices would rise following the merger. Um, okay, so this just to show, like they say, or the claim is that a merger will lower the prices, then Ying does a study and it finds actually the opposite, that prices would rise. Okay, so different from claim. Just, you know, something I would note while, before reading text two. Text two. Economist Dario Faccarelli and Fabio Panetta have argued that research on the effect of mergers on prices has focused excessively on short-term effects, which tend to be adverse for consumers. Using the case of consumer banking in Italy, they show that over the long term, the efficiency gains realized by merged companies do result, so they do result in economic benefits for consumers. Okay. So they're saying like long-term equals benefits, you know, short-term equals negatives. That's my negative symbol. Okay, so then five, based on the text, how would Faccarelli and Panetta most likely respond to fans findings in text one? Well, they would likely, I would, I would think that they would likely think that um, this is a result of a short term happening that perhaps in the future or long term it might change. So A, they would recommend that FAN compare the near term effect of a merger on subscription prices in the Minneapolis area with the effect of the merger in another newspaper. Well, that doesn't make sense because why would they be talking about like another market? They don't talk about crossing different markets. B, they would argue that over the long term, the expenses incurred by the merged newspaper company will also increase. No, they would argue the opposite, that in the long term, the prices will decrease. Um, so no. 
see, they would encourage Fan to investigate whether the projected effect on subscription prices persists over an extended period. Oh, oh my goodness, that seems like it's matching my prediction. But D, they would claim that mergers have a different effect on consumer prices in the newspaper industry than many, most other industries. No. I mean, they don't really make a comparison to other industries. It is true that they talked about consumer banking in Italy, but that's just to the conclusion about um, what happens short-term versus long-term. So here, it's got to be option C. Amazing. So number six. Um, the following is text from Jane Austen's 18 level novels, Sense and Sensibility. Eleanor lives with her younger sisters and her mother, Mrs. Dashwood. Eleanor, the eldest daughter, whose advice was so effectual, possessed a strength of understanding and coolness of judgment, which qualified her, though only 19, to be the counselor of her mother and enabled her frequently to counteract to the advantage of them all that eagerness of eagerest mind in Mrs. Dashwood, which must generally have led to imprudence. She had an excellent heart. Her disposition was affectionate and her feelings were strong, but she knew how to get them. It was a knowledge which her mother had yet to hear, had yet to learn, okay? And which one of her sisters had resolved never to be taught. Okay, so what is true about Eleanor? I mean, it seems like she's very, she's the voice of reason. She's the counsel of her family. She has strong feelings, but she knows how to govern them. So A, Eleanor often argues with her mother, but fails to change her mind. Um, well, first, I didn't get any context about them arguing. And second, I would think that maybe she can change her mind, but there's no context of that. B, Eleanor can be overly sensitive with regard to family matters. No, she's not overly sensitive. In fact, she keeps her emotions in check, it seems. Um, I'm basing this on this context. Her feelings were strong, but she knew how to govern them. So like, even if she had a strong emotion about something, she can be, you know, keep it under control. Like me. Okay, C, Eleanor thinks her mother is a bad role model. Um, I mean, it never says that she thinks she's a bad role model. And D, Eleanor is remarkably mature for her age. Well, I think this is our, our winner. She seems to be able to manage her emotions over anyone else in her household. And she is pretty young, but she is the counselor of her mother. So all context is leading me to believe that she is remarkably mature for her age. Okay, so seven. The following text is adapted from Charles W. Chestnut's 1901 novel, The Marrow Tra of Tradition. Mrs. Ockletree was a woman of strong individuality whose comments upon her acquaintances, present or absent, were marked by a frankness at times no less than startling. This characteristic caused her to be more or less avoided. Okay. Mrs. Ockletree was aware of the sentiment on the part of her acquaintances and rather exalted in it. Okay, so based on the text, what is true about Mrs. Ockletree's acquaintances? Okay, well, they try to refrain from discussing topics that would upset Mrs. Ockletree. No, she she's the one that upsets them with her frankness slash honesty. B, they are unable to spend as much time with Mrs. Ockletree as she would like. Um, it sounds like they don't want to spend time with her. C, they are too preoccupied with their own concerns to speak with Mrs. Ockletree. It's not about their own concerns. It's that Mrs. Ockletree is too honest and they want to avoid her. They are likely offended by what Mrs. Ockletree has said about them. Definitely. So she's frank with them and this startles them and people avoid that because maybe they're offended by it. Why else would they want to avoid her? It's got to be D. Okay. Eight, oh, a poem. The following text is adapted from William Shakespeare's 1609 poem, Sonnet 27. The poem is addressed to a close friend as if he were physically present. Weary with toil, I hurry to my bed. The dear repose for limbs with travel tired. But then begins, okay, so resting in bed. But then begins a journey in my head to work my mind when my body's work has expired. 
For then my thoughts from far from where I abide begin a zealous pilgrimage to thee and keep my drooping eyelids wide open. So it sounds like, I mean, basically he goes to bed, he is extremely tired, but he keeps thinking and thinking. And in particular, he's thinking about thoughts of this person. Um, like he wants to make these thoughts go to him and this keeps him awake. Okay, so let's see if my summary, <laughs> it matches any of the answer choices. So A, A, the speaker is asleep and dreaming about traveling to see a friend. Um, he's not asleep, he's awake in his bed. B, the speaker is planning an upcoming trip to a friend's house. I didn't get any upcoming trip happening. He's simply in bed um, thinking about his friend. C, the speaker is too fatigued to continue a discussion. There is no discussion. This is all in his mind. And D, the speaker is thinking about the friend instead of immediately falling to sleep. Yes, he's clearly thinking of the friend and he, he can't fall asleep. He's keeping his eyes open. Okay, amazing. Okay, black beans, thessalus vulgaris, are a nutritionally dense food, but they are difficult to digest in part because of their high levels of soluble fiber and compounds like raffinose. Okay, so black beans, hard to digest because high um, fiber levels and compounds and raffinose. Okay. They also contain anti-nutrients like tannins and typesin inhibitors, which interfere with the body's ability to extract nutrients from foods. Okay, so they also contain tannins and tripsin inhibitors. Okay, so in a research article, Maricela Granito and Glenda Alvarez from Simone Bolivar University in Venezuela claimed that introducing fermentation of black beans using lactic acid bacteria improves the digestibility of the beans and makes them more nutritious. Okay, so if lactic acid improves digestibility, then what must be happening? Perhaps it's making the soluble fiber levels lower, or it might be breaking up raffinose, or it breaks down the tannins or um, something to do with the trisome inhibitors. So if I'm looking something that directly supports that claim, I need something that matches that, that makes it easier to digest and therefore more nutritious. So let's see. Um, A, when cooked, fermented beans contain significantly more tristin inhibitors and tannins, but significantly less soluble fiber and raffinose than non-fermented beans. Okay, so if they have more tristin inhibitors and tannins, that's going to make them like less, less nutritious because they contain these anti-nutrients like tannins and tristin inhibitors. So if there's more, presumably it will make them, um, well, even less nutritious. Okay, so A actually contradicts because it makes it harder to digest. B, fermented beans contain significantly less soluble fiber and raffinose. Oh, so less soluble fiber. You see, that's what I said in my prediction. Then non-fermented beans. And when cooked, the fermented beans also displayed a significant reduction in trisome inhibitors and tannins. I mean, this matches what I was saying before I looked at the answer choices, that it has to have maybe like less, less soluble fiber or less raffinose and be, have less tannins and not as many as inhibitors. I think it's B, but I will check the other ones. C, when the fermented beans were analyzed, they were found to contain two microorganisms, lactobacillus, sessu, and lactobacillus plantarum that are theorized to increase the amount of nitrogen absorbed by the gut after eating beans. I mean, they, we don't, they don't talk about microorganisms anywhere and this doesn't deal with the digestibility or nutrition and 
there is also no mention of nitrogen. So that's just like totally off topic. And D, both fermented and non-fermented black beans contain significantly fewer trispin inhibitors than tannins after being cooked at a high pressure. Um, okay, that's interesting, but it's not differentiating the different effects of what about the fermentation that was induced in the actual study. So it's not really supporting the claim because it doesn't even touch on fermentation. And therefore, B is indeed our winner. Okay, continuing. So ablation rates for three elements in cosmic dust by dust source. So Earth's atmosphere is bombarded by cosmic dust originating from several sources. Short period comets, SPCs, particles from the asteroid belt, ASTs, Halley-type comets, HECs, and Oort to cloud comets, OCCs. Some of the dust material vaporizes, vaporizes in the atmosphere in a process called ablation. And the, and the faster the particles move, the higher the rate of ablation. Astrophysicist Juan Diego Carrillo Sanchez led a team that calculated average ablation rates for elements in the dust, such as iron and potassium, and showed that material in slower moving SPC or AST dust has a lower rate than the same material in faster moving HPC or OCC dust. For example, whereas the average ablation rate for iron from AST dust is 28 percent the average rate for is da, da, da. okay so this one's simple enough i just have to read the table and correlate it appropriately to complete this um passage so um a does say iron from spc dust is 20 percent and um that is true However, that doesn't mean it's correct because both SPC and AST dust are slower moving. So comparing um, the ablation rate doesn't really make sense or like follow the pattern that the passage is trying to illustrate because the whole point of this passage completion here is to show how ablation rates increase when dust comes from a faster moving source not just comparing the two um, slower moving sources. Okay, so I don't want to compare the two slower moving sources, so I discard A. Um, B, sodium from OCC dust is 100%. Okay, well, that's also true according to the passage. However, like the passage is focusing, again, on the ablation rate of iron to illustrate its point. So therefore, we need to an answer that involves iron to maintain consistency. Okay, so I should mention iron. Likewise, this doesn't mention iron, so I can discard um, D, even though it also is cracked. So therefore, it must be must be C. Iron from HTC dust is ninety percent. So why does C complete the passage? Because it's establishing that by, when I compare the ablation rate of the same element, in this case, iron, um, and slower moving dust. So slower moving dust is the AST, AST dust at 28% to a faster moving dust. The faster moving dust is at the HGC of 90%. This is um, helping to complete the passage and illustrate the point that faster moving dust leads to higher ablation rates for the same element. So this is the one that properly makes a comparison and I incomplete the passage. Okay, amazing. Okay, so graph question 11. Um, high levels of public uncertainty with economic policies, which upgrade policies the country will adopt can make planning difficult for businesses, but measures of such uncertainty have not tended to be very detailed. Recently, however, economist Sadly Alwatshayo analyzed trends in news reports to derive measures not only for general economic policy uncertainty, but also for uncertainty related to specific areas of economic policy, like tax or trade policy. One realization of her work is that a general measure may not fully reflect uncertainty about specific areas of policy, as in the case of the United Kingdom. Okay, 
where general economic policy uncertainty. Okay, so here I need to look what's happening for general economic policy uncertainty. So let's see. Um, okay, so general economic policy uncertainty. Oh, so option A, align closely with uncertainty about tax and public spending in 2005. Okay, yes, we could say they're pretty close. So I'm looking at here and here, um, but deferred from uncertainty about tax and public spending. Okay, in 2009. So 2009, I'm looking here. Uh, da, 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 da. But deferred from uncertainty and tax public spending policy by a large amount. And then tax. Okay, so here, okay, so, so those are pretty close and here and here, I mean, they're pretty close together and it says that they deferred by a large amount. I mean, no, we can say a small amount. So problem large. Eliminate A. Um, so was substantially lower than uncertainty about tax and public spending each year from 2005 to 2010 was substantially lower. Um, well, let's look across the years for B. So economic policies here and the public tax and public spending is here. So we can see they are pretty close, but um, this is white here, um, tax and public spending is higher. This is lower, this is lower, it's higher here. This is higher, this is lower. So was substantially lower each year? Not true. It was different, right, each year? Okay, C reached its highest level between 2005 and 2010. Um, in the same year that uncertainty about trade policy reached their lowest levels. Okay, so yes, it is highest in 2005 and 2010. Agree. Um, but let's see, in the same year that uncertainty about trade policy was at their lowest, is this at its lowest? No, this is actually at its highest here. So again, C is just data interpretation, incorrect. So it's gotta be D, hopefully it's D, um, was, so was substantially lower than uncertainty about trade policy in 2005 and substantially higher than uncertainty about trade policy in 2010. Okay, so here it's around, we'll say 90, and here it's around 99. Okay, yes, I can see that for 2005, and substantially higher than uncertainty about trade policy in 2010. So, <laughs> Um, so yes, I am actually looking at trade policy here. So yes, yeah, substantially higher or lower, yes. And substantially higher than uncertainty about trade policy in 2010. Also, we can see here, it's much higher. Um, yeah, so that, that checks off my, my boxes. And also, you know, it is an alignment with the data and also the passage because the passage says that um, one innovation for work is that the general measures may not fully reflect uncertainty about specific areas of policy. Okay, amazing. Oh my goodness, another one, 12, intense module one. Um, when hibernating, Alaska marmots and Arctic Ground squirrels enter a state called torpor, which minimizes the energy their bodies need to function. Often a hibernating animal will temporarily come out of torpor, called an arousal episode, and its metabolic rate will rise, burning more of the precious energy the animal needs to survive the winter. Alaska marmots hibernating groups, and therefore, okay, 
burn less energy keeping warm during these episodes than they would if they were alone. Okay. A researcher hypothesized that because Arctic brown squirrels hibernate alone, they would likely exhibit longer bouts of torpor and shorter arousal episodes than Alaska marmots. Okay. I mean, logically makes sense. Um, so which choice best describes data from the table that supports this hypothesis, which is, let's see. So A, the Alaska marmots arousal episodes lasted for days while the Arctic brown squirrels arousal episodes lasted less than a day. Um, okay, well, let's see if that's true to the data. So Alaska marmots arousal episodes, that would be 21.2 hours. So that would be less than a day. Right, and the Arctic ground squirrels is 14.2 hours. So the problem with A, like lasted for days, that's not true. So therefore eliminate B, the Alaska marmots and the Arctic ground squirrels both maintain torpor for several consecutive days per bout on average. Okay, let's check that out. Um, <laughs> duration per bout, we have 13.81 days for Alaska marmots and 16.77 for squirrels. Um, okay, well, well, this is an example where the data is correct. Um, you know, that that is true, but the passage or his hypothesis, it's all about um, arousal episodes. So it doesn't do anything to actually support his hypothesis. So like this is data true, but no support of hypothesis. C, the Alaska marmots had shorter torpor bouts and longer arousal episodes than the Arctic ground squirrels did. Okay, well, this is definitely comparing the two species in a way that is supporting the hypothesis. But let's see, so marmots and shorter torpor bouts. Okay, I mean, definitely we see it is shorter, right? 13.81 days versus 16.77 days. And we can also see that there is longer arousal episodes, right? We can see um, 21.2 versus 14.2 hours. So both of them check and those can help support the hypothesis. So I'm thinking C, but let's just check D. D, the Alaska marmots had more torpor bouts than arousal episodes, but their arousal episodes were much shorter than their torpor bouts. Okay. I mean, also, this looks like it is true, but again, like it's not comparing anything about the Arctic squirrels. Like no mention of Arctic squirrel, which is what I need, right, to properly um, support his hypothesis. So therefore it must be seen. Okay, yet another graph. So here we have employment by sector in France, the United States. Okay, we have agriculture manufacturer services and agriculture manufacturer services. And it says, over the past 200 years, the percentage of the population employed in the agriculture sector has declined in both France and the United States. While employment in the service sector, which includes jobs in retail, consulting and real estate, et cetera, has risen. Mm -hmm. However, the transition happened at very different rates in the two countries. Okay, this can be seen most clearly by comparing the employment sector in both countries. So I'm looking for two different rates, very different rates, but I still want to see like an overall decrease in agriculture and an overall increase in services. Okay, so let's check out a, 1900 with employment by sector, with employment by sector in 1950. Okay, so agriculture, 1900, and then it goes to, in 1950, it drops to 32. So that shows a decrease. 
that's okay. Let's check out services. Um, 28 to 35. So there's also an increase in services. Agriculture in the U.S. Um, goes from 41 and then drops to 14 by 1950. That's very different rate. And then 31 to 53, also extremely different. There is a decrease, right? But it's very, it's not as extreme in the U.S. for France. So, I mean, I'd say this, like, this is a difference of 11. And this one, it's a difference of 7. Whereas here we have 41 minus 14. Like, here's a 27% decrease. And then 53 minus 31, 22. I mean, that one works. But... Just to be thorough, I think it's A. I'm going to go through the other choices. Um, 1800 and 2012. Okay, so if I do 1800, it goes 64 to 3. Yes, decrease. Um, and then services go from 14 to 76. Also, a decrease. Um, and then let's see. Agriculture in the U.S., 68 to 2. I mean, first, those are very similar. And then 13 to 80. So this is true, but it's not very different rates. They're actually quite similar, and both are drastic for a choice B. Um, and same, let's see, 1900 with 2012. So 1900, 43 to 3, 41 to 2. That's pretty close and similar. And same, let's check out services, 1900, we saw it was, so in France, 28 to 76, and then here, 31 to 80. I mean, also very, very close. And then 1800 to 1900, I'm just gonna erase these to not be confused. Um, 1800 to 1900, so 1800, we go 64 to 43. 14 to 28, whereas US, it's 68 to 41. Again, these are very close with each other. And this too, it's very close. So the only one that shows significant difference, very different rates, it's A. Okay, so continuing our journey. Euphorbia usula, leafy spurge, is a Eurasian plant that has become invasive in North America, where it displaces native vegetation and sickens cattle. E usula can be controlled with chemical herbicides, but that approach can also kill harmless plants nearby. Recent research on introducing engineered DNA into plant species to inhibit their reproduction may offer a path toward exclusively targeting E usula. Consequently, a, making individual eusla plants more susceptible to existing chemical herbicides. Um, no, I don't, we don't want them. It's not about them becoming more susceptible to chemical herbicides. B, enhancing the ecological benefits of eusla in North, in North America. Um, it doesn't sound like they have much benefits and the whole point of doing the DNA engineering is to inhibit their reproduction um, because it's displacing vegetation and sickening cattle. You know, so we want to stop it. Um, didn't get any benefits. C, enabling cattle to consume USA without becoming sick. Um, no, again, like we want to inhibit their production so there's less of them. And if there's less, hopefully the cattle don't come into contact with it. D, reducing invasive USA numbers without harming other organisms. Oh, D is exactly what I think they hope to happen, that um, Eusula will, well, they'll reduce due to this DNA and the other plants won't have to suffer. Okay. Lunus is so into grammar. Okay. So, Bolsonia, Charopatra, an Indian American, and Diana Clayton, an African American, grew up frustrated by the lack of diverse characters in books for young people. In 2011, these two writers joined forces to found Cake Literary, a book packaging company. 
that specializes in the creation and promotion of stories told from diverse perspectives of children and young adults. Okay, I mean, definitely it's going to be B because it's just, it's an essential clause. So it's going on to explain the cake literary. You know, so like here's the, from here to here, this is all information discussing what click literary has done so there it would be no punctuation if oops if i opted for for example like this would totally remove that from the clause and just say horses to found cake literary specializes in the creation it becomes a fragment so that one doesn't make sense with no punctuation it's a run-on and that it's part of the essential clause and like same thing, um, we're describing what the company does. It's essential, so no punctuation, B. Okay, this looks like pronouns. In 1930, Japanese American artist Kira Obata depicted the natural beauty of Yosemite National Park in two memorable woodcuts, Evening at Carl Inn and Lake Basin in the High Sierra. In 2019, exhibited alongside 150 of Obata's other works in a single artist show at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Okay, so it's talking about how he depicted um, the its beauty in two memorable woodcuts. So these two, these two memorable woodcuts are what were exhibited alongside. So it would be A, option B. So just, you know, properly identify your subject there and you'll get it right. 17, American writer Adwidge Danticat, who, oh look, extra information, um, has won acclaim for her powerful short stories, novels, and essays. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that could be a complete sentence. So first, you know, we have one complete. Let's check the next clause. So if I start with praising, which is what the options are suggesting, praising her lyrical yet unflinching depictions of native countries' turbulent history, writer, I have the subject, has compared Dant Attack to Nobel Prize winning novelist Toni Morrison. Okay, so I also have a complete sentence. Whenever you have two complete sentences, you can separate with a period a semicolon or comma plus fanboy, but in this case, we only have the period as an option, therefore D. Okay, continuing. So in 1966, Ahmed Ashford became the first African American to umpire in a major league baseball field. His energetic gestures announcing when a player had struck out and his habit of barreling after a hit ball to see if it would land out of bounds. Okay, so right now it's incomplete. Um, transform the traditionally stolen umpire role into a dynamic one. Okay, this is all just one, you know, one complete clause. It's only lacking the verb. And therefore, so it lands out of bounds. What did it do? It helped transform. Um, so that would be option A. It's got to be A. You know, I need the verb in the sentence to help explain what's happening. Um, well, what's happening in the sentence. I need the finite verb. Okay, continuing. So really, when I'm reading on the exam, I would start here. Her 2014 novel, Boy Snowbird, for instance, is a complex retelling of the story of Snow White while her 2019 novel, Gingerbread, offers a delicious twist on the classic tale of Hansel and Gretel. Okay, this would just be C. It's only testing titles. Um, and you might be thinking, oh, but the title here has a comma before it. Well, first, that's only because like they put a transition word in between but the actual name of the, the 2014 novel is Boy, Snow, and Bird, no comma, right? And then Snow White, 
the reason why there's a comma after is because it's attached to a subordinating clause beginning with while. And whenever you're discussing a title, you can either put it in quotes or you can put it as italicized. And that's, that's all, there should be no punctuation. 20, the so also here, blah, blah, blah. in close collaboration with musicians, Tavari introduced changes to the shape of a traditional violin, flattening some of the instrument's curves and making, and making it lighter overall. Making what lighter overall? The violin. Okay, so it's referring to main subject, violin. If you're not sure, because I think a lot of students get this one incorrect, but you just need to ask yourself, like, what's lighter overall? It's the violin that's lighter overall. Okay, 21. During the neoclassical period, many writers imitated the epic poetry and satires of ancient Greece and Rome. They were not the first in England to adopt the literary modes of classical and antiquity. Some of the most prominent figures of the early Renaissance period were also influenced by ancient Greek and Roman literature. Okay, so first from here to here, it's complete or an independent clause. And then from here to here, it's also complete. And whenever you have two complete sentences, there needs to be a period, semicolon, or comma fanboy. So it can't be B. And it can't be A. These are comma splices. And then I have to determine where does the placement of however go? So if it appears at the end, which does here, I can also place it at the beginning to see if it makes sense. Let's see if it does. Um, however, they were not the first in England to adopt the literary modes of classical antiquity. That makes sense because it's talking about this first clause and how they weren't the first of its kind to adopt these modes. Whereas if I put it here, so, however, some of the most prominent figures of early Renaissance period were also influenced by ancient Greek and Roman literature. That's, there is no contrast. This is just explaining how they were not the first in England to adopt the literary modes of trans of, of classical, and ah, how they weren't the first to yeah, adopt classical antiquity. So it's got to be, let's see. Okay, so like always look for the placement and like determine where the contrast is occurring. And you can always take however, put it at the beginning of the clause like I did here to see too if it makes sense and if it is actually contrasting, you know, that clause. Okay, out of grammar, onto transition words, part of information and ideas of the exam. Okay, so one poll taken after the first 1960 presidential debate suggested that John Kennedy lost badly. Only 21% of those who listened on the radio rated him a winner. Mm -hmm. The debate was ultimately considered a victory for the telegenic young senator who rated high, higher than his opponent, Vice President Richard Nixon, among those watching on the new medium of television. There's a clear contrast, right, that like they thought he lost, but he actually won. So I see the contrast, and this is the only contrast word, which is nevertheless the same as however. Okay, so continuing our journey, in November 1934, Amrita Sher Jill was living in what must have seemed like the ideal city for a young artist, Harris. She was studying firsthand the color saturated style of France's modernist masters and beginning to make a name for herself as a painter. Long to return to her childhood home of India, only there, I believe, could she truly for us. Okay, so she's supposed to be having this great time, but she's not. So another contrast, which would be still. Still, it's another way to say, or it's used for when we come, which makes sense because, right, she, She's supposed to be in this ideal city. However, she longed to return home. Okay, 24. In his 1925 book, Morphology of Landscape, U.S. geographer Kyle Sauer 
challenged prevailing views about how natural landscapes influence human cultures. Sauer argued that instead of being shaped entirely by their natural surroundings, cultures play an active role in their own development by virtue of their interactions with the environment. I mean, it's definitely further expanding upon his prevailing views. It's explaining it more, so it must be D specifically. And specifically is used to expand upon or maybe give an example of the previous sentence, which is happening here. It's giving a specification of his prevailing views. 25, although those who migrated to California in 1849 drew definable nuggets in stream beds, the state's richest deposits were buried deeply in rock beyond the reach of individual prospectors. Hmm. By 1982, many had given up their fortune and dreams and gone to work for one of the large companies capable of managing California's complex mining operations. Yes, it's so here's like a cause that these people move to, you know, get these gold nuggets. They weren't able to get them. As a result, they gave up their dream. And, and for that reason, they started to work for these, you know, large companies that could actually mine out the gold. And therefore, C. Consequently. Okay, two more. Ooh, student notes. So the student wants to present the question study and its conclusions, which choice most effectively uses relevant information to accomplish the goal. Okay, so as a part of 2013, study of a catamestation was conducted on bone fragments found in Conchua, Conhutam, China. I mean, that's interesting, but it's not presenting a conclusion. So like no conclusion, therefore eliminate. B, a 2013 analysis of cat bone fragments found in Guanajuan, China, suggests that cats there may have been domesticated 5,300 years ago. Okay, suggests that there's a finding there. Um, okay, so that could work. C, in 2013, I could have studied what cats in Quanchan, China had eaten more than 5,000 years ago. That's explaining what they studied, but it's not showing any specific conclusion. Eliminate. In D, cat bone fragments estimated to be 5,300 years old were found in Quanchan, China in 2013. That's just, that's a true factual statement. It's not the actual conclusion of the study, which is that um, cats may have been domesticated over 5,300 5,300 years ago. Well, my goodness, final question of module one. Um, the student wants to emphasize a difference in the origins of the two words. Okay. <laughs> okay. I did a quick scan just because if I'm looking for a difference, I want contrasting language. And I can see option A offers that. So does option B. But here, option C, Kanya Shipsgar won the 2009 Scripps National Song which derives from the Greek word lakodia. That doesn't show a difference. And the Scripps uses words from diverse origins, also like no difference mentioned. So option A, word in, the final word of the 2008 script slash spelling B is of Anglo-French origin. Okay, so talking about origin. While the following year's final word derives from ancient Greece. This makes sense. It's explaining difference, right? Anglo-French versus Greek. But let's look at B. In 2008, Samir won the script slash spelling B by correctly spelling the word garden. However, the following year, so this is talking about winning. It's not talking about the origins. So derives, right, do, 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 an origin. So it's got to be A. And therefore, our answer. And that is module one. Stay tuned for module two coming at you soon. Thanks for watching the video. Like, rate, subscribe if you want to keep seeing more. And also see my amazing tips and strategies for everything SAT related. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.